Hey guys, welcome back. So today, working on my Coleman go-kart. Uh, this one I picked up used about six or seven years ago, and it was in good condition. I really didn't need to do much to it other than basic maintenance. Anyway, have never made a video on this, and I was actually getting ready to make one soon. I ordered some upgrade parts and a few replacement parts, and well, I just hadn't gotten around to it. Anyway, fast forward to today, my son was out for a ride. He came back without the go-kart and only this tire in his hand. The axle broke off. So yeah, the tire, it's no longer attached and it looks like we need a new one of these. So I've got a few things planned for this. I think most urgent is fixing that wheel. So let me get you set up a little bit better. We'll get this inside and make this thing right. Gonna take a second and just pressure wash this thing before bringing it inside because it is pretty filthy. It's actually been a few days since you saw me push this cart off the trailer and into the garage. I wanted to order and receive that new spindle before doing any work on this. Anyway, today I think is the day. The new spindle showed up. I actually ordered two of them, figuring if one went bad, the other one may not be that far behind. Anyway, that is really the only issue with this machine. You know, the engine runs quite well. Mechanically, everything is doing exactly what it should. You know, that said though, there are some upgrades my son wants. And he actually asked me a few years back to add reverse, add lights, and also add electric start. So I looked into those options and really came to the conclusion that it wasn't practical to add that to this car, at least not for a reasonable amount of money. So I kind of did the easy thing and just bought a cheap pair of lights, put a used generator battery in there in a way to plug the lights in. And that kept him pretty happy. And I really had no intention of doing anything more to this. Anyway, fast forward to a few months back and I watched a video that John Daniel did on a Doromax engine he bought. Uh, this one, just like his, came from Amazon. It was just over $200. Now this one, it's rated at seven horsepower, so it's a bit of an upgrade. The one that's on there now is only six and a half. And more importantly, this one has electric start, and I believe it also has a charging system. So by putting that on, we're going to get at least two of the three things he wants at a reasonable price. Now, 
I didn't do a whole lot of research on this as far as will this physically fit in place of that slightly smaller engine and is the crankshaft going to accept the torque converter? You know, I think the answer is yes to both, but I'm not really going to know until we get into it. So hopefully it's going to work out. So for this electric start to work, of course, we need a battery. So I got a battery, a tray. I've got some wire and a bunch of switches to make everything work the way that it should. I also got some upgraded lights, so we'll get those on. And then we have some common maintenance things that are overdue. The chain that's on there right now is actually only a number 41 chain. It's supposed to be a 420. So that's what this is. We'll get that swapped out. Also, the original belt is on the torque converter. It's got to be close to 10 years old at this point. So we'll swap that out as well. And I also picked up a couple new shocks for the front because even before the spindle broke, I noticed the shocks weren't looking very healthy. You know, a new shock like this, it is straight up and down. And if you look at the used one down here, you know, I think you'll be able to see something isn't quite right. So that shock most likely is doing nothing. And I have a feeling the shock over there was not much better since the spindle broke off. So the plan is to get this up on the lift table once I get it cleared and we'll start digging in on the front. We'll get everything done here. We'll move on to the back and get that engine swapped out. Now, before I can do any of that though, I do need to get the extensions on the lift table so this thing will fit. So let's get that stuff taken care of. We'll get this up in the air and get going on this thing. It's a little bit heavier than a generator and the extensions they are just long enough we're kind of on the edge on all four corners or at least close to the edge we don't want this rolling too much or we're going to get ourselves into trouble so i'm actually going to jack up this end just a bit so that we can get the new spindle and wheel installed and before actually putting that new stuff on i'm going to add a strap to each side just to kind of keep this thing locked in so we don't have any accidents. Looks like just two bolts hold this entire spindle in. And man, that is on there. I'm not sure that one actually came out the right way. There's a nut on a stud and it's the stud that's spinning and I'm not sure it's advancing any further. So hopefully we have better luck with the top one. Yeah, it looks like the same thing on the top one. It's not the nut that's spinning out. So let's try, actually we do have one more right here for the steering, so let's hopefully have better luck with this one. And no, it is not turning. So I don't know if we have thread locker on these. So I might apply a little bit of heat, although I don't want to ruin this rubber boot either. So, hmm. Yeah, 
Let me try the impact. I think that's the problem. This is supposed to move up and down and it's frozen in place. This pivot is and this one as well. So I guess we need to remove these bolts and clean them up and get this whole mechanism moving again. The good news is I don't think we have an issue with this being locked up or rusted up. It looks like the issue was this bolt right here. We have a lock nut that was actually tightened down so tight that the joint couldn't move. So when putting it back together, you should not clamp it down so that things don't move because you see what happens here. Anyway, as far as these go, these are actually ball joints in there. And I did not realize that they were actually kind of locked up initially. So those weren't doing a whole lot. So I should be able to get a wrench on that and hold it still. Looks like this side took a little bit of a hit. Just bend that back. Gonna leave everything kind of loose for right now until we get everything back together and then we'll tighten these up the way that they should be. This is the old shock. Definitely don't think it was doing anything. Can't do that on the new one. So let's just see if we can unscrew this piece right here. And then we should be able to get the spring off, maybe. Yeah, definitely a bad shock. Just taking all the tension off the spring. I want to make sure this one works. <laughs> um... Okay, well, let's just say they're not shocks, they're springs. But there is no shock action there.
Unbelievable. It's a different size. And this was absolutely advertised for this go-kart. So, yeah, it's not going to fit without some modification. Let's just see how far off we are. New one is 0.37 inches. And the old one... 0.29, so about 0.3. So a little bit different. You know, I'm guessing the difference is metric versus imperial. You know, I hate to modify this too, just to run into issues down the road when I have to replace this again and end up getting a different size. So actually, let's pull the broken piece out, make sure this is a match. If it's not, then this part's going right back. It's nice they put a castle nut on here. You wouldn't want the wheel to fall off. Yeah, I think I need to hold it still and actually pull out the broken piece from the back side. So let me grab some vice grips and an impact. Try to get that nut off. Let's double check this one. We got 14.9 on the thickest part. And let's just check where the shoulder is here. 11.8. So let's see how that compares. We'll start on the shoulder of the new. And we're at 11.7, so very close. And yeah, so... At least the diameter seems to be pretty much there. Let's just double check the length. Yeah. Length seems good. So I think this is going to be okay. We just need to drill for these larger bolts. I think the rest is going to be fine. do. And we're stuck. There we go.
we'll leave it like that for now. We can fine tune it later. Right now it's in a position where it's going to be kind of soft suspension. You know, we can always drive the spring in more to kind of stiffen things up. I think we'll leave it right there for now. The saga continues. These spindles may have been the worst purchase I have made. You know, I mean, this modification, okay, not a big deal. At least they provided the correct size nut to thread on. The steering tie rod, no problem. But they did not include a new castle nut. And the old one, although it's in good condition, it's not going to thread on. So, yeah, going to have to wait till the morning to pick up a new one of these. So I made a trip to the local hardware store this morning and surprisingly, they were able to find an M12 1.25 extra fine thread castle nut. So threads on there without issue. That said though, there is an issue. If you look at the old one, you can see those slots go down a lot further than the new one. And because of that, I can't actually put the pin where it needs to go. So I'm gonna take the angle grinder and just bring this down a little bit further and then I think we'll be in good shape. Yeah, I guess it wasn't really that bad once you know how to do it. I think the biggest annoyance was just the fact that we had some different hardware, some different hole sizes, and really wasn't prepared for that. Anyway, it's together now. And now that I know how it's done, I think the other side's going to go a lot faster. You know, I also went back over everything. I just added thread locker to all these nuts just to make sure nothing's going to come apart. Well, at least this one's not locked up. Though this spring is doing absolutely nothing. So this washer, I think, is supposed to be further up. And something broke. So yeah, this spring is not doing anything. Yeah, nothing wrong with that.
That one was loose already. So next, I think I'm just going to cut out all this old lighting stuff and the old battery. So we just have a bunch of zip ties going around and some rivets holding these brackets in. So we'll drill those out, get everything out of the way. And then I'm going to mount up the new lights. You know, the wiring, I'm not going to do now. That's probably going to be the last thing we do once we figure out what's going on with that engine.
So I picked up a set of these. We're just gonna put one on each side, uh, very similar to the lights that we just took off of there. This also came with a bracket so we can drill and attach it directly to that tube. Uh, but this time I'm gonna do something maybe a little bit smarter. I got this mount that just clamps onto the tube. So we can put one of those on each side and then install the light right there on each of these brackets. So let's get these attached, throw the lights on, maybe test them out real quick by connecting a battery, make sure they work, and then we can move on to the engine. This bracket for the light just gets bolted on like that, uh, but I'm a little concerned that it's gonna spin around. So I did cut up a few pieces of rubber to kind of use in between. So my hope is when I tighten this down, that piece of rubber is gonna help hold it where it needs to be. Perfect. All right, let's give this a quick try. I've got these lights temporarily wired in to this wire right here, which runs over to this 12 volt battery. So let's kill the lights in the shop, connect it to the battery and see what we get. Very nice, no issues. Those lights are nice and bright. So we'll get rid of the temporary wiring and let's move on. You know, the front is about as far as I can take it for now. I think the next move here is to get the old engine off, temporarily place the new one in and just make sure it's gonna fit. To get this engine out, I think I'm gonna actually start by getting this rack out of the way. It'll be a lot easier without this here so I can just lift the engine out once it's unbolted. Now there's only two bolts. Well, there's supposed to be two bolts on each side. Uh, we actually only have one. So we'll get those bolts out. That'll come right out. And then we can start disconnecting the wires and the cables, get the chains off and eventually unbolt the engine from the frame. Well, that is a little bit interesting. This cross member right here has a label that's upside down. It's actually crooked and there's supposed to be a bolt on each side holding it in. And I don't see any bolt holes here until you get right up to the top. And that actually answers a question I had a long time ago because I bought this net, it didn't come with it, it was supposed to. And the top of the net has these loops that are supposed to go around a pipe, which isn't there. And if you look right there, you can actually see evidence that maybe it was installed there at some point and something happened to it. So let me see if I can get this out. It's kind of wedged in there right now, put it actually where it belongs, and then we can move on to the engine. Man, it is really wedged in there. Right, let's give it a little bit of persuasion, see if it comes out of there. You know what, I'm gonna undo all these straps and once this is installed, we can just install the net properly. I'm not sure I did it the right way, but given the pole it was missing, I just did it in such a way that it 
would hold the net in place. Now I can tell you that this bracket, I think it's supposed to have the corresponding piece on the other side here, which I don't have. So for right now, I'm just gonna run some bolts in to hold this in place. You know, I think I'll circle back on this at some point and get the proper part to hold it in. But for now, I think it'll be better than, well, how it was before. Question is, how do we get it in here? And this might be why it was never installed in the right spot. I think the only way to get it in is to actually pull these apart. It's so close. There we go. Pretty sure this whole net is on backwards, so just taking all the straps off. We'll try it the other way. I got a little bit sidetracked, but we are back together. So I'm going to put that on the shopping list. I want to get one of those brackets just to make it a lot stronger. Uh, but I think we'll be fine for now. And the net, well, it's held on there much better now. So let's move on. Let's get this cover off the torque converter, uh, see what we can do in there. You know, I think we also need to get the air box off so we can get better access to this throttle cable to disconnect it. Yeah, so one thing to keep in note here is that, you know, a stock Honda clone has throttle control right here and a spring washer. The other engine, I'm sure, has that spring washer, so we'll have to remove that so that the throttle can move freely. And we're likely going to have to transplant these things as well. You know, I'm not even sure if that engine can accommodate it. So, you know, worst case, we can most likely move the entire bracket if we need to. And next, I'm going to try to get this torque converter cover off. There's just a few 8 millimeter bolts going around. And once those are out, theoretically, this cover will just come off. Uh, my concern, though, is this frame rail. It's right up against the cover. And actually, this is as well. So I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get it out of here until we get the engine out. Uh, but I do want to get it out now, if possible, because that's going to give us a little bit better visibility as to what we're doing down below. And we're in. It wasn't that bad actually either. I was imagining it to be a lot worse. And now that this covers off, I can actually see this is gonna be a lot easier than I thought. You know, initially I had assumed we'd have to pull off this jack shaft, pull both chains, the one that's up here, and there's another one 
down there. And I thought we'd have to pull this engine mount off as well, but I don't think that's the case. We just need to remove this pulley and a couple bolts under this bracket hold the engine in. So once those bolts are out, this thing should come right out of here. And I've already unplugged the kill switch that goes to the front. So let's remove this bolt. Yeah, hopefully the pulley's not rusted on. And assuming that comes out, we should be more or less home free. Yeah, just a little 10 millimeter bolt on there. So that makes me a little nervous. Hopefully it comes out. So we'll give that a try. Also note, I unplugged the wire from the spark plug because with the ignition switch unplugged like it is, this engine actually has spark and there is fuel still in here. So when I remove this bolt, it's going to spin the engine and yeah, you don't want it to fire. So the way that it is right now, there's no risk of that. So we'll try the weak impact first. Nope, need the big one. Nice. They don't want this engine coming off. There we go. <laughs> oh boy. How on earth? Okay, well that's going to be a bugger. The next engine bolt looks pretty much impossible to get to. I already tried a socket. It is not possible. And I looked underneath. There is no bolt. So this must be a stud that they welded to the jack shaft and the engine mount. So the really only wrench I can get in there is this one. And I can turn it, I don't know. <laughs> half an inch so I'm hoping it's not that tight otherwise I'm not sure what we're going to do yeah it's not tight which kind of makes sense because I don't know how they expect anyone to make that bolt tight so when I put the new engine on I'll probably throw some Loctite on this one because it's not going to be very tight. Theoretically, we should be free, and we are.
That's a nice looking engine. Unfortunately, it's not going to work, at least not without some modification. Now, my mistake here was not pulling this engine first and measuring up this crankshaft. Instead, I did a little bit of research and found the specs for this engine. And according to that, it said it had a three quarter inch diameter shaft, which it does, but the length was supposed to be two and seven sixteenths of an inch. And this is actually two and three quarters. So this is quite a bit longer than I thought. And when I ordered this engine, really the only thing I looked at were the specs on the crankshaft and it had a three quarter inch crankshaft and this one was actually a 16th shorter from what I thought that one was. But now that this engine's out, you know, I've measured it up and it's actually two and three quarters of an inch long. So this is quite a bit longer than that one. And that is not going to work with this pulley. It's just too short. So I guess I've got two options here. One, I can buy another engine or two, I can swap the crankshafts. At least I think I can. You know, these are both clones of a Honda GX200 and likely the crankshafts are interchangeable. You know, I won't know that for sure though until I get them out and measure them up. So I think that's what I'm gonna do. So let's start with the old engine. We'll just get the oil out of it, open it up, get this crankshaft out, and then we'll do the same on this one. And with any luck, we can swap the cranks and be in business. So I'm going to need to pull the flywheel off in order to get the crankshaft out. So in order to do that, I need to get the carburetor off, get this front blower housing off, and of course the flywheel and the fan. And then we can turn the engine around and open it up. Gonna tilt this back just a bit because there is still some oil in there. So by doing that, the oil should stay in. And it looks like we're loose, probably just hung up on the dowels. 
There we go. Yeah, still a lot of oil in there. So let me get that, the rest of that out. And then we'll work on getting that crankshaft out. I've never seen that before. If you look at the crankshaft, it's actually hollowed out with a big end of the connecting rod connects. So I don't know if that's a performance mod or if that's just saving a bit of money. It's kind of odd. Anyway, before pulling this completely out, you know, I think I'm gonna turn my attention now to this engine. We'll get it opened up the same way. And I wanna do a quick visual on the crankshafts. Make sure there's nothing obvious that's gonna prevent us from doing this swap. We do have a charging coil, so that is good news. Now, according to the tag, it shipped without oil. That said, they usually come with a little bit of oil. So we'll tilt it back just to make sure. The good news is the gasket came off in one piece so we can reuse that. And from looking inside the engine, I would say this is a bit of an upgrade. Uh, the other engine had a plastic camshaft gear. Uh, this one's at least metal. Uh, we have an oil sensor. The other engine didn't have that. And we have the same hole right there going through the crankshaft. So on the surface, I'd say things look pretty good. You know, I did quickly just double check the dimensions of some of these parts that I can reach and compared it to the other engine. And we seem to be in the ballpark, if not an exact match. So I think I'm gonna keep going on this one. We'll get the cap off, we'll get this crankshaft out, do the same on the other engine, measure things up a little bit more carefully. And if it looks good, we'll throw the other crank in here and close this one up. Gonna rotate the engine until this timing mark aligns with the one on the crankshaft, and that should be top dead center. And when it's in that position, the camshaft should just come right out.
Same procedure over here. We'll just rotate the engine a bit until we get the timing marks aligned. <laughs> or the cam will just come out right now. Wow, that one doesn't want to come. So I've got the two cranks side by side, the old one on the left, new one on the right. And visually, they look the same with the exception that the older crankshaft has the longer output shaft. And given that they're both clones of a GX200, likely they are the same and interchangeable. But let's just double check that the journals are in fact the same size. So we'll start with the old crank and try to get a measurement here. Now, ideally, I'd be using a micrometer for this, but I don't have one actually between the one and two inch range, which is what this is. So on this journal, we are at 0.9825 inches. Let's check the other side. Point nine eight two five. So they're the same size on each side. Let's see if this one's the same. We're looking for a 0.9825. And we're close. Yeah, 0.9825. So that is good. Let's check the other side. Should be the same. 0.9825. At least it was for a second. So good, both those journals are the same size. Now, the most important journal is of course the one the connecting rod goes on. And this is a used crank, so likely it is gonna have a little bit of wear. So let's just check the new one first. And the new one, 1.18, maybe a touch under. Let's see what the old one's at. Hopefully it's close to 1.18. And by close, I mean exactly, or within a couple ten thousandths. Yeah, we're at 1.179. So it's actually a little bit less about a thousandth less than the new crank. And that, and that's kind of to be expected. You know, I'll look up what the acceptable wear is on a crankshaft of this type, but I don't think a thousandth is gonna be an issue, especially since it wasn't knocking in the old engine. So let me pause it, take a quick look what it's supposed to be and make a decision. Yeah, I just double checked online the specs for a Honda GX200 and the standard size is 1.18 inches on this journal and that's what I measured with the caliper. Now the same article said we are allowed up to two thousandths of wear and in this case we are coming in at about a thousandth of wear. So we are within spec and we can use this crankshaft.
this red stuff, it's just Permatex assembly lube. You know, engine oil works fine. That's all that was in there from the factory. But this stuff is going to give it a little bit better protection for the first start. We're going to have to double check the push rods on this engine. They didn't fall out like on the older one, but when I just put these followers back in, you know, I don't think the push rods are actually on these followers. So we'll have to reinstall those. Just double check the valve clearance before the first start. Just double checking the timing here. You see at top dead center of the exhaust stroke how the exhaust valve closes, the intake opens, and right then is where the piston goes from traveling up to traveling down. So the timing does appear to be correct. Let me just rotate it one more time till we're at top dead center of the compression stroke, which is right there. And it seems like we do have clearance. Let me just double check, usually around five thousandths for the intake and seven for the exhaust. And that's actually the minimum spec that Honda has. The intake, I think they allow up to seven thousandths on the intake and nine on the exhaust, which is a bit much, but it's better than too tight. So in this case, it does not appear that a seven thousandths fits which is good let's check it on the exhaust it should fit on the exhaust and it's actually pretty tight all right let's see where we're at on the intake we'll start with the four thousandths It seems like we're less than a four. Let's check the exhaust. Four fits. Oh, we got two there. 
five feels pretty good. Let's check a six. And I'd say it's not a six, it's closer to a five. And the intake, yeah, definitely not a four. Let's try a three. And a three fits. So we're at three and five, I'd say we're a little tight on both valves, but let me just double check. This engine did come with a manual. Most likely it does specify the exact specs for this engine. Unfortunately, it does not list what the valves should be set to. And interestingly enough, this doesn't say it's 212 or 208 cc's. It says 196. So yeah, somewhere in that range. Anyway, it does say to check the valve clearance every year or every 300 hours, but it doesn't say what to do if it's off or even how to tell if it's off. So yeah, these are a little tight right now, three and five, that's too tight. I'd feel better at four and six or even five and seven. So let's just increase that clearance a little bit. Wow, that is tight. So it's actually too tight now, which is why I set it to five thousandths. They usually do tighten up when you tighten the lock nut up, but I'm hoping we're still at four. And no, we're not even out of four. So let's try this again. Sometimes you can snug that lock nut up just a little bit and see what's going to happen. In this case, I can tell it's pretty tight. And now a five feels pretty good. feels fine. So I'm happy with that. Let's do the same on the exhaust. Four thousandths fits fine on the intake. And a five doesn't really, it's too tight. Uh, so that's fine. We're somewhere between a four and a five. On the exhaust, five thousandths fits just fine. And a six, it's snug. I'd say it's a six. So I am happy with that. Let's just add a little bit of oil in here. It's looking pretty dry and close it up. I'm also going to put a little bit of oil in the cylinder. So when we start it up, don't be surprised if it smokes for a minute.
So we'll get this coil mounted back up. Need a 10 thousandths gap between the coil and the magnets. We'll set that using a business card. Once the magnet's under there, you can just loosen it up. The magnet will pull the coil right to where it needs to be. And then just snug the bolts up. Perfect. I think I'm just gonna move this entire throttle assembly from the old engine over to the new, mostly because it already has the hardware we need to mount the cable. And the new engine, although it does have the spots for the hardware, it doesn't have the welded nut on the bottom side like this. So this one's suited a little bit better for the task. So to remove it, just two bolts and the governor spring underneath, and then we can move it to the new engine. I think we'll get that spark plug back in there. I just envisioned this bolt coming right out, going into that cylinder, which would not be a good thing. And this is what I'm talking about on the old panel. We have these two welded nuts right there. On the new one, we have spots for them, but they're empty. And those are actually, well, for two different purposes. This one is an extra support for the air box, which I'm not sure if this air box can take advantage of. We'll take a look when putting it back together. And more importantly, this is for clamping down on the cable. Uh, so once it's connected to the go-kart, you know, we'll be able to control it with the pedal in the cart rather than this lever. Tighten that up just a little bit. Doesn't need to be that loose. And that is actually too tight, so maybe quarter turn back. Yeah, that should be perfect.
How on earth did they get that on in the factory? Let's try a different one. One that's a little bit more forgiving. And that's it for now. I'm gonna leave the airbox off because once I get this installed in the go-kart, we need access to get that cable installed. And with the airbox in place, we can't do that. You know, as far as the torque converter goes and the starter recoil, we'll just leave those off for now. I really wanna hear this thing run before going any further. Make sure that the engine sounds okay given what we did internally. So let me spend a second just get a battery connected. We'll get a little bit of fuel in the tank. We'll turn it over and hopefully we hear a good sounding engine. I think we're off to a good start. No sparks anyway. Uh, that said, that vice grip most likely is gonna shake off once I try to start this. So hopefully it stays on long enough to get the engine going. Uh, right now the fuel valve is off. I'm just gonna test cranking the engine. Make sure everything looks good from an electrical standpoint. Yeah, no issues. So let's turn the fuel on and try this for real. It's trying. Oops. All right, let's try this again. We lost the vice grip on the back so we weren't able to crank it. You know, I guess the good news is the engine sounds really good. There's no knocking, but it's not running for very long. So let's see if we can get it to run a little bit longer. Not too bad. Uh, the engine, it sounds good. There's no knocking, no funny noises. So I think the crankshaft swap was a success. Now we do have another issue, surprisingly. Uh, the carb, it's running the engine too lean. You know, I was having issues getting it to idle. I was having issues getting it to throttle up. And after applying a bit of choke, I could throttle it up, but then I heard the surge. And you know, I turned the choke off and then I could really hear it. So that is fairly typical of these Honda clones, kind of in the 200cc range like this one. You know, the carbs, they're just lean out of the box. So I'm gonna pull the pilot jet out, drill it up two or three sizes, and we'll try it again. 
So that's what we're after right there. That is the pilot jet. And even though the engine was surging at high speed, there was no load on the engine. So really the only jet in play is this one right here. So to get it out, you just need to remove the idle set screw. And once that's removed, you can use a screwdriver to pry that pilot jet out. All right, let's see where we're starting here. Usually for this size engine, it's just about a 78, maybe a touch under. So let's see if the 78 fits. And it does not fit. Let's try the 79. And yeah, the 79 fits. So this is, I would say, close to a 78. Uh, the last jet I drilled out, I actually had to go all the way to 75. Uh, so in this case, let's start a little bit more conservative with the 76. We'll try it out. And if it's still too lean, we'll bump it up one more to the 75. So if you're going to drill jets out, just keep in mind, these bits do break pretty easily. And if they break in the jet, you're most likely not going to get the bit out. You're going to need a new jet. And of course, if you drill it too big, you can't put material back in. In that case, you'll also need a new jet. So I guess what I'm trying to say is don't do this if you don't have extra jets because you very well might need an extra. It's taken quite a while. So I don't know if this drill bit is maybe done. Or maybe I should have drilled a smaller size first, like get to a 78 and then a 77 before the 76. So let's do that. Let's get the 78 in there. All right, we are through. And that took a lot longer, even with the 78, than I expected. So I'm going to just go one more to the 77. And I think I'll stop there for now. We'll try that out. Just put this idle set screw in until a couple threads go through. Don't drive it all the way in, because you can actually over-rev the engine like that. Okay, let's try this again. We'll give it partial choke, since the engine is a bit warm. All right, how about full choke? Sounds a lot better. Nice. That's all it was. The pilot jet. It was too lean. And I'm not that surprised. I mean, I've had a lot of issues recently. Actually, the last three new carburetors I've purchased for a 200cc Honda clone were all too lean. I've had to drill them all out. And this one's no exception. We have a brand new engine with a brand new carburetor. And it was running poorly. It was surging. And unfortunately, a lot of that has to do with getting certifications that you're meeting emissions guidelines. And by doing that, you're actually causing the engine to not run properly. And a lot of these are probably going to end up in the trash sooner than they should because they're not running well. Anyway, that issue is behind us. And I think the engine issue is squared away. So let's get that starter recoil back on. I want to get the pulley installed and we'll drop this in the go-kart, see how it fits.
So I've got a breaker bar on the flywheel nut, and I'm going to tighten this down to 19 foot-pounds. Now, I don't have an exact spec on this, but if this was a generator with a bolt of this size, I would torque it to that to secure that rotor. And there we go. fits on there pretty well, uh, but we do have a problem. I was kind of worried about this right here. You know, although this has the same footprint as the original engine, the original engine was fairly close to this bar right here. And once you add on this control panel, we're now within about a third of an inch, which would be fine, except for the fact we have suspension right here. So every time we hit a bump, that control panel is just gonna hit that bar it's going to limit the suspension and eventually destroy that. So, you know, I had wanted to keep controls both on the back and the front, but given this interference here, I think we're going to have to eliminate this and just go with the controls in the front, which for the most part's fine. I think the only thing we're going to be losing here is a circuit breaker for the DC charging. And there's also a diode there, which rectifies the power for the battery charging. So we're going to have to come up with something for that. You know, as far as the rest of it goes, I mean, everything lines up, the pulleys line up, and of course, the bolt holes. So the big thing left really is to get the wiring squared away. So I'm actually probably going to pause it here, and I'm going to do a lot of the grunt work. I'll turn the camera back on, kind of catch you up, and then finish it up. All right, let me catch you up real quick. A lot of the grunt work is done and we're ready to finish this thing up. Yeah, I pulled this control panel and actually harvested the diode out of it for the charging system and made this custom cable here. It has the diode. It also has a fuse to protect the circuit. And the way this is gonna work is that this end connects to the stator output. That is AC coming out. And the other end is gonna connect to the starter solenoid where the wire comes up from the battery. So this will always be a live wire. The diode will block it from back feeding into the stator, but when the engine's running, it'll convert the AC into post DC and charge that battery. So this part is ready to go. I also had to make this cable right here, which basically splits it into two. And this is gonna go to the ignition coil. So what that's gonna allow is for the low oil system to be able to shut the engine down. And then the other lead is gonna come up to the front of the machine. So when you turn the switch off, it'll ground out the coil through this extra connection. So this stuff is pretty much ready to go. You know, the only other thing here worth considering is the start solenoid, which is this wire right here. So that wire needs to also be extended to the front. Uh, to that end, most of the front has been wired. I pulled out the original wire that was feeding this switch right here. It was a very thin gauge wire and only had two wires in it. I actually need three. So I pulled a heavier cord through with 16 gauge wire and it also has three wires. So that's going to allow us to get this thing completely wired up. It's hidden under this conduit right here and everything's been tied in. The lights are all wired up zip tied out of the way. Uh, we're going to pick up the negative through the body ground. Uh, we're picking up two, one for the lights and one for the engine kill. And then the three wires coming up, one of them is going to be full time 12 volts. That'll power the lights. And also when you hit the start switch, it'll send the 12 volts back in this wire right here to the engine to engage that starter solenoid and crank the engine over. And then lastly, the final wire is actually gonna be the engine kill. Uh, so when you flip the switch to off, it'll pick up ground from right here. It'll send it through the switch, down this wire, and ultimately to the engine. So this is more or less ready to be done. 
or finalized, I should say, by installing the switches here on the control panel. Now, the original intention was to not use this switch anymore. It was just going to be kind of filling the hole. You know, I didn't want to use it because it has that thin gauge wire and there's no amp rating on it. So I just cut it. The plan was to leave it, drill some new holes and just use a key switch, you know, right next to it. And then we'd add a couple other switches as needed. Unfortunately, that plan is not going to work out because the bracket that holds this on actually extends pretty much the length. And I really don't want to cut this bracket up. So we only have this small space over here for switches, which would be this one right here. And then we have just enough room for another one. So the other one will just be a toggle switch, most likely this one for the lights. You know, the only concern is bumps might turn the lights off, although the spring seems to lock in place pretty well. So I don't think that'll be an issue. If it is, we can always swap it out for just a regular toggle switch. And as far as, you know, starting and stopping the machine, you know, this switch only has one function, or I guess two, on and off. And that's it. We need a switch with three different positions. And I actually think I have one. I have a parts generac over there that has electric start. It has a switch that I believe will just install right here without any modification. And that will provide you know, on, off and start capabilities. So let's pull that switch out and make sure it's gonna fit and do what we need. And we'll get that installed. We'll finish wiring the front. And then in the back, we are pretty far along as well. I added this wire right here. This will be body ground connected to the engine and battery negative. And then here's the lead I pulled through with the three wires. So one will be connected to battery positive, the other one, the ignition coil, and the other one, the starter solenoid. And then of course, you know, we got to drop the engine in and mount the battery. So I'm going to use this bracket right here. It's aluminum, unfortunately, you know, if it was steel, I would just plug weld it right to the frame. But in this case, I think I'm just going to use some self tappers. We'll get this secured, get the battery installed and just finalize everything. So I'm just removing a couple of screws here on the front of the control panel, which should free it up and hopefully allow me to open it up. And once we have access, we'll pull the wires off the switch and try it out on the go-kart. Now, I'm not 100% sure it's gonna physically fit. And even if it does, you know, we might still have issues because this Generac, the solenoid is switched using the negative and on the go-kart, it switches the positive. So it may not be compatible. So we'll test that out real quick. I'm pretty sure this switch can be wired up either way. At least that's my hope. In case you're wondering, this is a Briggs engine on this Generac frame. I've been using this as a test stand. And this was the machine that Ken gave to the channel. It actually belonged to one of his customers. I ended up using it as a parts machine. And as a result, I saved two other Generac GP 7500s. You know, Jason's needed a new engine. Brendan's needed a new power head. And the engine that's on here right now, actually, this was Eric's engine that had blown due to a lack of oil. You know, he opted to repower with a Subaru, but this engine was very rebuildable. So I did rebuild it and it runs well. So this generator has served a few purposes, saved a few machines, and hopefully it's going to get the electric start to work on the go-kart. So hopefully this switch has six terminals on it. And yes, it does. So I think we can use this. This is a pretty standard switch I see in most generators. So the way it works is that you have three terminals on each side. The middle one is what you want switched, meaning, you know, say we want to kill spark. We'd put a ground wire in the middle and then depending upon the position of the switch determines where the connection's made. So if I flip the switch to the right, it should connect these two terminals. In this case, that's off. So that would kill the engine if I had a ground wire there and the other wire goes to the ignition coil. Now, if I wanted to wire the same thing for the electric start, 
I'd put battery positive in the middle and instead I want the connection to be made when I hit start. So I'd connect another wire right there which would go to the starter solenoid. And in this case, Generac just used one side of the switch. You know, the middle side is a source of ground, I believe. So when you hit, turn it off, that will kill the ignition coil. And when you hit start, it'll send the ground to the starter solenoid. At least that's my belief. So let's get these wires off. We'll get the switch out and just verify that. Maybe. Did they glue it in? Yeah, they did. So let me pick at that. Hopefully it'll come out. There's our prize. So let's test my theory real quick. We'll put this kind of in the neutral position, the middle, and we'll hook up a lead right here. And the way this works, I have it set to test continuity. So if a connection's made, it'll beep. So we'll put one lead right there. So the only time this should beep is when I flip the switch toward the black lead and we get nothing. That's not good. Let's try start. Okay. And we get a connection there. So maybe it's not intuitive, but hopefully it's what I think it is. So now let's hit start. Nothing. And if I turn it to off, we get a connection. So yeah, it seems to work the way I thought, only opposite of what you think. So if we want it to make a connection for off, we put it like that. Perfect. And a connection for on. Yeah, I think this is gonna work fine. Let's just make sure it's gonna fit. Yeah, I think it's gonna be fine. So I'm going to reinstall this cover We'll run the wires through, drill the hole, finish up the wiring in the front, and then we'll move on to the back. Did I grab a Del Duro bit? <laughs> I may have. Yep. That one's dull. Let's try a different one.
going to make it a little bit bigger, but I can see we have another problem now. I put it on the lower side because of the size of this plate. It's kind of favoring to be installed here so it doesn't end up kind of sticking over like that. But since I put it so low, if you look at the body of the switch, it's going to hit against this rail. So yeah, that's, that's going to be an issue. The other toggle switch I have, it's actually probably going to work out fine. So yeah, I guess we're not going to get the cool switch, but we'll get at least a switch that works. So let's open that up a little bit more and I think we'll be good. Actually, it goes in upside down, so up would be off, down would be on. I don't think we can use the cool cover anymore. Unless you want to install it like that. I guess I could break the tab. But no, that's not going to make a whole lot of sense. So like this, down would be on, up would be off. I think we'll stick with the other. Man, is that close. Now, you know, the cool switch will work. It's really just this ground tab on the side that's the issue, and that is going to light up the light. So I'm thinking, you know, it doesn't matter if this ground tab touches anything. It doesn't really need to be protected. So if I bend it all the way, I can probably just solder a wire to it because like this I'm not going to be able to get the connector on but when it's bent all the way like that I think it'll install yeah it installs just fine you know worst case if we can't get a ground wire on there it's still a good switch it just won't have the cool light but I think I can fix that Yeah, that'll do. We're close. Yeah, I think that'll do. For the ignition switch, that will be off. 
So we need a source of ground right in the middle, which is this black wire right here. It just runs to the body ground. So we'll put that right there. And then when it's in the off position, it's this tab that's now connected. So that is going to be the return wire, which I believe actually is going to be the black one. That'll go to the ignition coil. So that'll go in right there. And for the other side, we need battery positive, which is that guy right there. That's going to go to the middle tab on the other side. And we want the engine to crank when this is up, which will be the bottom tab right there. This is the wire that's going to go to the start solenoid. So that'll go right like that. That should be it. We just need to fit this in, tidy up the wires up front, then we can move to the back. too tight. Ah, it's too tight. It's actually smushing it. Now the switch does not move at all. So I need to pop this back out, just lengthen it by the tiniest amount. Now it's in there pretty good. All right, is it going to fit now? Maybe. Perfect. Actually, before we go much further here, let's get this bottom chain off. It is the wrong type of chain. It should be 420 chain. So I can just see the master link right there. We'll slide that off, get this chain off and put the 420 in its place.
I just wanted to show you the difference real quick between the number 41 and the number 420 chains. Uh, the number 41's on the left, the 420 on the right. They are compatible, meaning I can use either one on the sprocket. Uh, the big difference is just the amount of material, meaning how strong they are. The 420, you can kind of see the links look a little bit thicker and it becomes really obvious when you turn them on their side. We got the number 41 on the top and the 420 on the bottom. So there's quite a bit more metal on the 420. So that makes it quite a bit stronger. It's kind of hard to show you, but the chain tension, it is too tight. So we do need to take some of that tension off. And to do that, it's actually a fairly easy adjustment. It can be done right there. We just need to loosen up the nuts. And in this case, we need to bring this platform down a little bit to give us a little bit more slop on that chain. Anyway, before I do that, there's one other issue I discovered when putting the new chain on. You know, initially I put the new chain on on the sprocket coming off the jack shaft and then fed it down to the bottom sprocket and the two didn't align. They were way off. And what I found is that this upper sprocket, it's not secured at all. The only thing holding this on is actually the chain itself. So we are missing a bolt and a washer on the end of that shaft. So I already dug around. I found something that'll do for now until we find the right part throw a little bit of thread locker on there. So hopefully that stays on long enough until the right part shows up. think that'll be good. You don't want it too loose or it's going to skip teeth. But if it's too tight, you're going to cause a lot of wear on the components.
it's just about impossible to get the good angle here. Anyway, I'm plugging in the wire that comes from the start switch up front into the start solenoid. That's the coil wire that triggers it. And then right here we have a terminal that is gonna be battery positive and also the charge circuit. No smoke, at least not yet. Let's try it out real quick. We'll try the lights. No issues there. And let's crank the engine. Beautiful. So let me just take a second. I'm gonna clean these wires up a bit and then we're getting pretty close. I think we just need to put the air box back on, the cover for the torque converter and Oh, throttle cable would be nice too. Let's do that first and then finish it up. Interesting. I am just noticing we are missing a set screw right there. And that actually sets the max RPM. So without that, I'm not sure what the max is. And I'm willing to bet it's well over 3,600 RPM. And I don't want my son to blow this engine up immediately. So let me steal the set screw from the other bracket. We'll put it in there right now. We'll have to set it later. Uh, for now, we'll just kind of eyeball it. Uh, later, we'll get the tack out and set it to 3600 RPM. Actually, change of plan. I think it's gonna be a lot easier to set the engine speed without this cable attached. So I'm going to actually drive in the set screw further than it needs to be. And we'll get the engine started, hold the throttle open till it hits the set screw, double check the engine speed and make adjustments as needed to reach 3600 RPM. Actually, we'll probably do just a little bit over. Now I did actually have to remove the chain that you just saw me put on. So, you know, the torque converter is gonna engage the jack shaft, but there's no chain to the output wheel. So nothing should launch off the table. So let's get the engine started. All right, good. We are now roughly set to 3,600 RPM when that is touching that set screw. Now I did notice the carb, it was still surging a bit. So we might have to go in there and drill that out a little bit more, but I think things are gonna improve once we get the air box installed. And of course, once we add that chain back, the engine will actually be under load and the main jet will come into play. Anyway, to attach this cable, what I've done is actually fully depressed the pedal so that the cable is extended. So right in this position, this is full throttle. So when I install it, 
What I want to do before setting this set screw right here is to hold this in full throttle. So that way when the pedal is physically down all the way, we have the right throttle position on the carburetor. And once that's done, I'm actually going to remove this set screw here because my worry is if for some reason that pedal goes a little bit further down and the thing limiting the amount of acceleration is actually the set screw, then there's going to be a lot of stress on this cable, a lot of stress on these components and something might break. So I'd rather have the pedal being the limiting factor than anything in here. It was a little bit hard pushing that pedal with one hand and holding the tachometer with the other, but hopefully you guys could see it. You know, it was pretty much perfect. We were at 3,690 RPM, and that's without a load. You know, once we add the chain back and the wheels are engaged, you know, the governor is going to have a bit of droop, and likely we're going to be below 3,600 RPM. So I think we're pretty good as far as this adjustment goes. So I want to finish it up get the airbox on, get the cover back on, the torque converter, and of course throw that chain on. But before I do that, I wanna start it one more time without the chain. We'll get a voltmeter on the battery, and I wanna make sure that we are charging. All right, let's try this out. We've got the multimeter right here connected to the battery. We're starting at 13.13 .13 volts. So when I crank the engine, the voltage is gonna drop and recover. Now, hopefully it keeps going beyond where it is now. I wanna see the voltage climbing if the charging circuit's working. Okay, good. No issues charging the battery. The voltage is actually sitting higher than it was before. So we have everything wired correctly. And I guess the big question of my mind is, will that charge the battery faster than the lights can drain it? You know, that I am not sure about, but to be honest, we're not doing any extended night driving. So I don't think that is really a concern. So let's finish this thing up.
Yeah, this engine also comes with an EVAP system. So it's not a vented cap. Instead, this rollover valve vents and the fuel vapor comes down this line routed next to the exhaust and the spark plug, which doesn't seem like a good idea. And it goes down into this canister where then there's another line that comes up and it's supposed to plug into the air box right there. And unfortunately, the throttle cable goes in right there. So there is no way to reattach that line. So for now, I'm going to remove it from the canister. We'll leave the line coming from the tank past the exhaust down to the bottom of the engine. But I'm gonna have to keep an eye on that. You know, I don't know if any fuel can splash out of this line and potentially leak out of there. If it does, then I'm gonna to have to swap the tank with the one on the other engine that has just a normal vented cap. So what do you think? You ready to give it a try? I think so. Okay. Well, truth be told, he did try it a little bit earlier this morning. And it went pretty well. Although there were a couple issues. So let's try it again. And hopefully things go a little better. And I want to say a couple of issues. They're actually kind of minor. Uh, one of the lights moved out of place. And it was also a funny burning smell coming from here. It kind of smelled like the belt was burning up, so hopefully that's not the case. You know, I guess time will tell. So let's get the fuel on, it's actually already on. All right, you can start it. And have some fun. How's it driving? What? Kill it. How's it driving? It's driving pretty good. You notice any issues? No, not really. Anything better or worse? Or is it about the same? A little bit more bumpy. Speed seems to be a bit better. And it seems to have more power behind it. Okay, good. Here's the real question. Can you start the engine without using the choke? Okay. Oh! Yes, he can.
kill it. And I can definitely smell that burning smell again. It smells like burning rubber. So it's got to be the belt unless something is rubbing against a tire. But they do feel cool. I guess I don't know what it is. It's definitely coming from the back though. So something's running hot. So maybe we should drive this up. Or actually drive it around a few more times, get it hot again, because it's kind of that smell's gone away. Then we'll drive it back up and we'll try the thermal camera, just see if we can find any hot spots where there shouldn't be. I just set my son for another lap to warm it up, whatever it is that's causing that smell. You know, I'm thinking it's a tire, possibly the torque converter cover. So once he gets here, we will try taking a look at the thermal imager. Uh, this one's made by Top Don. They sent it to me to try out, and I can't think of a better chance to try it than on something like this. All right, let's try this out. So we can see, actually, yeah, the torque converter does look pretty hot. Uh, you can see the brakes are mildly warm. Yeah, I wouldn't expect that, although it is right against the engine. So, you know, maybe that is normal. Let's take a look at the wheels. They look cool, at least the back left. Front left looks fine. Front right is fine and so is the back right. So yeah, I'm thinking it's something with the torque converter. So let me get this cover off and get a closer look. I've got the cover loose. So let's get it out of the way. We'll just take a look at it and make sure none of the pulleys were rubbing on it. And no, I don't think that was the issue. It looks pretty clean in here. Nothing melted. You know, the belt still seems pretty good. Uh, we do have a bit of oil here on the crankcase. Uh, that is just getting flung up from the chain. I did oil that. So that is not a concern. You know, nothing is excessively hot. So I say we run it a little more without this cover. That way with the thermal camera we can have a little bit better look if the issue is in here or not. All set. Let's have a look at that. 
Yeah, the belt is warm. According to this, the belt is like 170 degrees. And that is where the smell is the strongest. So it's not happy about something, you know, whether it's just new belt break in or maybe, you know, maybe I got the wrong belt. I'm not sure. You know, either way, I think it's an easy fix. We can always throw the old one back on there. Yeah, I guess the other possibility is that the pulleys are misaligned. But they don't look it. So, I don't know. You want to drive it a little more? See if we can get some smoke off that belt? Or should we put the other belt on? Let's give it a little, let's drive it for a little bit more. See what happens. All right. Let's see what happens. So much for the yard. I'm gonna fix the headlights real quick. <laughs> I was gonna say we're looking good, but yeah, um, what happened here? It just kind of spun on that tube. So yeah, I, I guess I kind of saw that one coming. So I might have to reinforce that a bit. You know, otherwise I'd say I think we're doing pretty good back here. You know, I don't smell that smell anymore. And we'll just take a quick look with the thermal camera. You know, and things seem to be pretty stable, if not a little cooler. It's about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So I think it's just a combination of a new belt and maybe a little bit of chain oil getting on the belt. So, yeah, I guess I'll keep the cover off for now and just keep an eye on it. Anyway, I think I'm going to wrap the video at this point. There's really not a whole lot more to do. You know, if you want to find out more about this thermal camera, I'll leave the information down in the description. And if by chance I get that remote choke kit, you know, I might add that on to the end of this video as well. You know, otherwise, I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching. Yeah, of course, we've got to try it out at night. So if you made it this far, you might be interested in this remote choke kit. This is an OEM Honda part. Not exactly a cheap part either. I think it was $30. And yeah, there's really not a whole lot to it. We get a modified choke lever that will accommodate a set screw to hold the choke cable in place. And we also have a bracket that bolts on right here. 
to hold the cable in the proper spot. So to install this, we do need to get the air box off so we can swap out the lever. Then we can put it back together, put the bracket on, and then we'll test it out with the cable. Yeah, not a great fit. It's actually a little tight in this slot. So I'm wondering if the other airbox from the other engine might fit this a little better. I had to pull the choke lever back off. I forgot there is a spring here to assist with turning the choke off. So there's no real instruction on how this goes, but I'm thinking the spring should hook on like that. So we have a bit of preload on it. And the lever goes down. So now when you pull the cable to turn the choke on, there is some spring tension. You can see it's already partially springing back and it takes very little effort to turn that choke back off. So this is the air box from the other engine. And I like it better, I guess for two reasons. One, the build quality is better. It's thicker plastic. It's also more like a Honda OEM airbox. And if you look at the slot here for the choke, it is pretty wide, so I don't think we're gonna have an issue. And you can see the difference when comparing it to this airbox. It's a very tight fit, which is fine if you're running the stock choke lever. But in this case, we do need the extra space. So let's see if this thing will go on. It's a tight fit. It's actually hung up on the fuel valve. There we go. Yep, choke moves nice and free. And the fuel valve does too, so I think this is gonna work. And we'll leave this loose for now, but this is what holds the cable casing in place. And then we have one last piece for the choke lever, which is this little guy right here. We have an E-clip to hold it in. Let's see if we can clip that on without launching it across the room. There we go. Yeah, I think that's going to work out perfect. Now, the cable routing actually isn't bad either. It comes around here. We can zip tie it right there against that rail. And then it shoots up under the seat. And the length is pretty much perfect. Comes out right there. So all we need now is a bracket 
to hold this in place, and I think we'll be in good shape. So this is going to work something like this. That slot I cut out should slide over the cable down here. Then it goes right up like so. We can tighten up that nut and the choke lever is going to be nice and secure. So really the last step here is just to get this bracket attached down on the floor of the cart. So I've already loosened up the seat. You know, I can't get it all the way out without removing the seat belts, but I don't think I need to. You know, if I can just get it out of the way enough, you know, we should be able to secure this. So to solve this headlight problem, I'm thinking I should put some threads right here. We can thread a bolt in 
And on the tube that this clamps down on, we can also drill a larger hole without threads. And this will just serve as a locating pin to keep those lights from turning. Okay, let's try it out. The engine's cold, the choke is off. Let's just crank it, see if it'll start without the choke. And it will not, so we'll turn the choke on. There we go. Well guys, that's pretty much a wrap. You know, going into it, I actually thought this was gonna be a short video. You know, this go-kart has been well-maintained. You know, I thought we would do a quick engine swap, a light upgrade, and call it done. And of course, that's not what happened. Instead, I think I just made the longest single video I have ever made. And in the end, we have a pretty unique machine. We have some nice bright lights, an engine with maybe a little bit more horsepower, electric start, a charging system, and of course we fixed a bunch of things along the way that I didn't even know were a problem, like that gear on the jack shaft that had basically nothing holding it on. Anyway, you know, this machine, I think it's 100%. You know, I'm going to keep an eye on that belt a little bit longer, but, you know, I've taken it as far as I can for now, so... I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.